By looking carefully at the facade of Milan's Duomo, even an observer not accustomed to the architectural language is taken aback. The classical form of the portals and the windows does not correspond to the Gothic style of the cathedral. If we go back a few centuries, and precisely to the year 1353, we can see that the area was occupied by different buildings. On the left rose the summer cathedral of Santa Tecla with the baptistry of San Giovanni. On the right was the winter cathedral of Santa Maria Maggiore with the baptistry of Santo Stefano. There's uncertainty about the precise location of the large bell tower that served also as civic tower, built by Azzone Visconti on the remains of the tower destroyed by Barbarossa in 1162. It was in 1353 that the bell tower collapsed and seriously damaged the façade of Santa Maria Maggiore, which was rebuilt in the following decades. Soon the old church became too small for the ambitions of the city, and in 1386, when Gian Galeazzo Visconti became Duke of Milan, the construction of a large cathedral was decided, which would replace the two churches. In order to construct a new building, the two baptistries were demolished. In 1456, also the Basilica of Santa Tecla was torn down to make room for the new square. Its north side aisle, with its columns, was incorporated by architect Solari into a new porticated building, the Portico dei Figini, named after the family of the person who ordered it, Pietro Figino. On that same year, the representatives of the Fabrica del Duomo, i.e. the factory of the Duomo, decided to mark with a porphyry column the spot where the façade rise. The column will stand there until 1591, when it was decided to complete the construction of the cathedral, and the column was sold. Later on, in order to complete the construction of the Duomo, the near Portico delle Bollette and a portion of the Palazzo Ducale were demolished as well. The Church of Santa Maria Maggiore, gradually incorporated into the new building, was demolished in later periods. Its façade served for decades as temporary façade for the new cathedral and was eventually demolished in 1638. The old façade has been reconstructed here by Andrea Rui on the basis of the ancient coat of arms of the Fabrica del Duomo and of ancient paintings of the cathedral under construction. For the proportions, Andrea Rui has based himself on the golden section in a constant relationship between the measures of the elements of the façade. The façade was built on two levels with the lower one in polychrome marbles. It had a tricuspidated crowning reminiscent of Venetian architecture, and in particular of the ancient façade of the Cathedral of Mantua, designed by Pierpaolo dalle Masegne, to whom many attribute also the paternity of the façade of the old church. The church had the three entrances, the main one preceded by a prothyrum supported by columns placed on lions. The two orders of the façade were separated by a horizontal band of small loggias with statues. A large rose window illuminated the central nave. On the top there was a turret with the bells that, with the progress in the construction of the new cathedral, will be transferred to a temporary bell tower. Inside the Duomo, on the wall of the left aisle, we can still admire sculptures that belonged to the old church. 
We do not know whether there was an original project for the facade, but the oldest images of it show that it was flanked by two large bell towers of an architectural style that matched that of the side buttresses. The debate about the new facade began in 1582 when Pellegrino Tibaldi, in charge of the Duomo factory since 1567, had the doorway to the northern transept demolished, the famous Porta Verso Compedo, and we position where the red column stood since 1456 to mark one extremity of the cathedral aisles. This became the new entrance to the cathedral. The foundations were laid, but the project was not completed. In the meantime, the debate on the new facade had begun, whether it should be in Gothic style or in the Roman style, in accordance to the neoclassical taste of the period. A solution, this, that implied the issue of harmonizing the old with the new. In 1587, Martino Bassi replaced Pellegrino Tibaldi, who in the meantime had left Milan. Bassi drafted at least seven sketches for the façade, all marked by the absence of bell towers. In 1590, also Tolomeo Rinaldi will propose a project, which foresaw a façade on two orders, with a central pronounce and two grandiose bell towers on the sides. However, the projects of Martino Bassi and Tolomeo Rinaldi were not so prestigious to be immediately approved. Therefore, after the death of Gregory XIV and of Bassi himself, the chapter in 1592 was forced to hold a contest open to the architects of Rome, Florence, Venice and of Spain where Pellegrino Tibaldi resided. Tibaldi designed a façade on two orders with a marked horizontality. The first order, surmounted by an attic, was punctuated by ten columns and five doorways. The second order, square-shaped, was limited to the central nave only, and it had a single opening, flanked by two pairs of columns with three giant obelisks on each side. The gigantic Corinthian columns, about 24 meters high, supported an impressive cornice, protruding almost 5 meters from the profile of the façade. For the sides, Tibaldi proposed two tall bell towers on three orders. The design recalled the façade of the Escorial, but also that of St. Peter in Rome. In 1609, Cardinal Borromeo approved the design of Tibaldi with a few modifications and sent it to Spain together with a request for allocating a portion of the Ducal Palace to the factory of the Duomo. He obtained the consent and this allowed the start of the works for the façade. The stone suitable for the columns was found on the mountain of Baveno, where two engineers identified a single piece of pink granite detached from the mountain that was sufficient not only for the ten columns of the lower order, but also for those of the upper one. The columns were to be transported by a large boat with sides designed to facilitate loading and unloading. After crossing the lake and sailing along the Ticino and the Naviglio Grande, the vessel would reach Milan. It was also necessary to carry out some hydraulic works, such as the enlargement of the locks, the demolition of a few bridges and of certain buildings on the portion of the canal running through the city. The project of Tibaldi was further elaborated by Bisnati and by Ricchino, 
who proposed many variations, eventually incorporated into the final project of Fabio Mangone. In 1621, thanks to Giovanni Pietro Carcano, who bequeathed a huge sum for the construction of the facade, the works, which had been interrupted by an economic crisis, were resumed. The testament provided that the sum should not be spent for the columns, but only for the doorways and windows of the facade. On July 10, 1628, finally the operations for the transport of the first column began. However, its weight broke the ropes that held it, and the fractured column ended up at the bottom of the lake. Mangone, mortified by this failure, will die on the following year. In 1638, Carlo Buzzi succeeded Francesco Ricchini in the direction of the factory of the Duomo. In 1645, given the difficulties posed by the huge marble columns to the construction, Buzzi presented his own project for the facade, a project which preserved the classical elements already completed, but took up the Gothic motifs of the cathedral and included two high bell towers on the sides of the facade. In contrast with the project of Carlo Buzzi was that of Francesco Castelli presented in 1648, which proposed a completely new design, a reinterpretation of Tibaldi's old project in a pseudo-Gothic style, with shorter spiral columns, a portico with pointed arches and an upper tympano, reminding of the ancient façade of Santa Maria Maggiore. Over the following decades, countless projects were presented in which the Baroque style coexisted with the Gothic one, while the classical elements were mostly hidden by a portico. However, the works remained suspended for a long time. Only in 1683, the old 14th century façade was demolished and the new front was closed with masonry works to support the first span of the church. By then, the correspondence principle with the Gothic building had convinced the factory of the Duomo to follow the road indicated by Buzzi. However, in 1657 Buzzi died and was replaced by Girolamo Quadrio in the direction of the works. The last project presented between 1787 and 1791 resumed the work of Buzzi. In 1805, upon the insistence of Napoleon Bonaparte, a project of Felice Soave was eventually chosen, a solution that maintained the original profile of a gable cathedral without destroying what had been already built. The decision was taken only six days before Napoleon was crowned as King of Italy with a famous iron crown. He was so euphoric that he promised that the cost for the completion of the Duomo would be carried by France. At that point, upon his pressure, the works were finally completed within seven years. As a sign of gratitude, Napoleon requested that the statue of Saint Napoleon be placed on a spire of the Duomo. It is the fifth from the façade on the main nave to the south. In 1884, when the work seemed finally to be over, Aristide de Toni, a wealthy representative of foreign producers of lace and embroidery, bequeathed a large sum for changing the Duomo's façade. However, the money would not have been sufficient to remake from scratch the façade, but only to rebuild its crowning, which had been completed in a hurry and with poor materials. In September 1886, an international competition was launched to which more than 120 competitors took part. In that period, dominated by the ideas of Yolé Le Duc, according to whom monuments had to be brought back to their original style, any architectural promiscuity in a historical building was considered offensive to common sense. 
In August of the following year, a second level competition was announced, to which only 15 artists selected from the previous competition were invited. On October 27, the jury received architect Boito's report that declared architect Giuseppe Brentano the winner and expressed the hope that a project of architect Luca Beltrami would be also accepted to build an isolated bell tower that would include the finest parts of the facade to be dismantled. Brentano died at the end of 1889 without being able to complete the executive drawings of his project. He left a wonderful wooden model of the cathedral that can still be seen at the Museum of the Duomo. In the meantime, the question arose whether it was really necessary to destroy the nice parts that had been created over the centuries by so many artists whose only fault had been not adopting the styles of the old masters. It also became clear that it would not have been possible to finance the reconstruction of the entire facade. The works which had just begun were suspended in 1902. It was decided to appoint a commission for the reform of the crowning element in danger of a partial collapse. In 1910, a different project was developed for the decorations and was completed in 1925. In the following decades, the big doors will be completed, starting from the central one, created by Ludovico Pogliaghi and dedicated to the joys and the sorrows of the Virgin. Finally, a curiosity. In 1938, Benito Mussolini announced the construction of a bell tower in Piazza Duomo, designed by Pico Viganò, which should have been called the Tower of the Memories, of the Victories and of the Glories. The 164 meters high tower should have been completed by 1942 and should have become the tallest bell tower in the world. It all came to nothing, because shortly thereafter Italy went to war, with the tragic consequences that followed and which threatened to damage the Greek cathedral that had attracted for centuries the best artists, a concentration of works of art that has not.